Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Parent Resource Center's uh, webinar this Friday, April 9th. Um, we will um, be having an amazing presentation um, around collaborative problem solving um, from um, some uh, terrific presenters. Um, but first, I, um, my name is Mary Beth Harrison Cunningham, and I'm the manager here at the Parent Resource Center, and we really welcome you to today. Um, want to let you know that the chat box is open uh, throughout the presentation today, so as you have questions along the way, please don't hesitate in putting those into the chat, um, and I know our presenters will get to them um, as soon as they can. We will also have a Q&A at the end as well. So so if you, as you think of questions along the way, um, certainly jot them down. We want to make sure that we get to those today for you. So first, I would really like to introduce Marie Thomas. Uh, she is a licensed clinical social worker and has been in the mental health field for over 15 years, providing home and community-based counseling, outpatient therapy, and crisis intervention to youth, adolescents, and adults. Uh, Marie gained her LCSW in 2012 and has developed a strong working relationship with Fairfax County Public Schools while serving in her current role as the program director of Leland House. Leland House is a short-term residential program located in Centerville, Virginia, that works with adolescents ages 12 to 17 who are struggling with mental health concerns such as depression, anxiety, suicidal and homicidal ideation, as well as self-injurious behaviors. Leland House is a public-private collaboration between Fairfax County Community Services Board and UMFS. If you're interested in more information about Leland House, um, I will be actually sending out um, a flyer um, after the webinar today um, for you to have that information. And you are welcome to reach out to Marie for a virtual tour or additional information at the number provided on the flyer. Marie is proud to introduce two of her UMFS colleagues, as the presenters for today's training. Thank you so much, Mary Beth, um, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to prioritize this training, and hopefully you guys have an opportunity to, uh, you know, gain some new perspectives and insights and skills, and, and we're definitely available um, at the end for any questions that you guys might have in regards to the, the model of collaborative problem solving, or if you had any specific questions about Leland House um, as the program. Collaborative problem solving is the evidence-based model that we um, have integrated and utilized within Leland House. Um, and two of my colleagues are here today. They do the vast majority of the collaborative problem solving presentations internally for our agency, and then of course externally for community partners um, like today. So I uh, just wanted to have an opportunity to introduce them to everyone. Um, Carmen Daly is going to be one of our present uh, presenters today and she has been an organizational learning manager at UMFS since 2015. Prior to that she served as a supervisor in treatment foster care and oversaw resource parent programming in the Richmond area. She earned her master's degree in conflict analysis and resolution in 2012 from VCU and um, has included extensive coursework in adult learning programming. She is passionate about helping others rethink conflict and to grow their conflict skills. As an organizational learning manager, she builds strong uh, teams and individuals through training, coaching, team building, internal consulting, and more. She is a certified trainer in collaborative problem solving through Think Kids at Mass General Hospital. And Carmen has worked in experiential outdoor education uh, and has honed her facilitation skills through working with a wide range of audiences. So super happy to have uh, Carmen come in and facilitate this topic um, this morning. And she's joined by um, Leslie Perez. Leslie is a family systems coordinator with UMFS and has been here since uh, 2012. She oversees the recruitment, certification, and retention of foster and adoptive families. Prior to UMFS, she worked at another foster care agency for 16 years with similar responsibilities, including matching of families to meet the needs of the youth referred. Prior to working in foster care, she began her career working in a residential treatment facility in Norfolk, Virginia. And she has always worked with high-risk youth and families um, or youth that are at risk for uh, growing up without family connections 
or have suffered mental health illnesses along with behavioral and educational difficulties. She's a certified crisis intervention training trainer, including collaborative problem solving, and has been part of the SCAN, which is Stop Child Abuse Now, and COA, Council of Accreditation, and the Northern Virginia Bridges the Gap Steering Committees. All right. So um, welcome, and I'm proud to introduce Carmen Daly and Leslie Perez. Good morning. We are just considering how awkward it is to hear your own bio read out loud. Thank you, Marie, for introducing us. <laughs> We're glad to be here uh, on this Friday morning. Um, I'm Carmen Daly. I'll be one of the facilitators today and one of the CPS trainers at our agency. Um, and then I'll just start by saying, aside from the information Marie gave you about us, um, I you know, previously, whenever I did trainings for families, especially for parents, I was quick to say I'm not a parent. I don't have children of my own. And so I don't pretend to be an expert on parenting. And previously, my relevant experience was always that I work part time at a restaurant. And so the large majority of my experiment experience implementing CPS was with high schoolers and college kids and other adults even um, who I supervise. And so using CPS, collaborative problem solving, as a problem solving tool at work. So I'm a big believer that it can be used really with anyone. It's not a model just for kids or just for people with behavioral challenges. It's really anytime you have uh, expectations that aren't getting met or a problem that you'd like to solve with someone else. Um, though more recently, I would say I'm engaged and my fiance has a, a 15 year old now and a 12 and a half year old. So I got thrown right into the middle of parenting, uh, middle ages, and I'm, you know, now putting all my skills to work, uh, you know, in real life <laughs> with real children. And it's been really fun so far. I've had some successes and some that we're still working on, but I'm trying to put my money where my mouth is and use our model in my own home as well. So <laughs> I'll let you know how that goes. Um, so that's a little bit about me. We are both certified through Think Kids, which is again, an organization out of Mass General Hospital in Boston. So the materials you'll see today are, I think these are actually our materials, but it's their content. Uh, we're grateful for our partnership with them. Think Kids has been great to work with, and we're happy to connect you to their organization uh, and some resources at the end of this if you'd like more information. And you can also ask us towards the end of the presentation if you want information about implementation uh, or how we got started, because a big part of our role is figuring out how to implement an, a model like CPS across a, a broad agency with a range of programs, including direct care like Leland House and also treatment foster care, school-based programs, um, and community-based programs. So there's a lot that goes into it. So uh, that's who I am. I'm glad to be here, and I'm going to turn it over to Leslie Perez to get us started. Well, thank you, Carmen. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I am a parent, um, and it is interesting over the years how things have changed as we approach parenting and challenges and helping our children grow. Um, uh, the way that I was raised is a little bit different than the way I raised my own children, and I am sure that we will continue to grow as we learn more about people and development. So I want you to start this morning thinking about a time when there was a situation you had with a child, whether that was your own child or somebody that you were working with, and things just really didn't go the way that you had expected, right? Like you, maybe you gave them a task and they didn't complete it or they didn't do it when you had asked or you said no and then you got a, a big reaction from them that was unexpected. And then think about how you addressed it. Like what, what didn't go well? Um, for you? What were the challenges in approaching that? How had it worked even in the past? And I just want you to sort of hold on to, to that moment. So for today's, oh, let me ask, does anybody know anything about CPS already? Whether it's in the chat, you can put a thumbs up, you can, um, do a smiley face. Have you heard of collaborative problem solving? And it's okay if you have, and it's okay if you haven't. Today, we're going to take a little bit of an exploratory, good job, Kim, take a little exploratory into it. It really revolves around the philosophy, skill, not will, right? Um, 
and so we will talk a little bit more about what that means um, and understanding the pivotal role that skills play in leading to adaptive or maladaptive or challenging behaviors. Um, we're going to learn about the three plans that are involved in collaborative problem solving and the goals that are pursued by each of those and learn why collaborative problem solving is a good fit and it's a trauma-informed care type of approach and understanding um, what the plan B, what a plan B is. Um, you may have heard some of those buzzwords and then as Carmen mentioned, what some of the next steps are in becoming, um, learning more about collaborative problem solving. So when we talk about collaborative problem solving, it really is the foundation of it is skill, not will. People do well if they can, not just when they want to. It sounds simple enough, but it does have some huge ramifications. So let's take a look at kind of what this means. So for those of you on here, it'll say turn your cameras on and off, but I, we're not going to be doing that. But I want you to do a thumbs up. You should have a sticker or the ability, again, to raise your hand or agree or disagree with this statement. Have you ever felt like you just can't find the right word to say what you're feeling or thinking? Have you ever spaced out in a meeting? Not this one, of course. Have you ever had a hard time finding your cell phone or just didn't, couldn't find it? Right? Have you ever impulsively said something to your child that you later, later regretted? or perhaps said something to a spouse that you later regretted? Have you ever been so anxious about something that you put it off for as long as possible? Wow, all right. Have you ever gotten frazzled by a loud or unexpected noise? I love to see the responses because the one thing it shows us is that we all have lagging skills, or we've all had a situation that made it harder for us to access the skills that we needed in order to manage that time, that moment, that situation. We're never always at our best. Um, and it's a good reminder of the philosophy of skill, not will, to build compassion for the kids that we work with. Isn't it safe to say that if you could have handled these situations better, you, you, you would have? Well, let's take a look at what skills and what we're talking, oops, what skills, what are we talking about, right? We're talking about skills, communicating what you're thinking or feeling, paying attention, it's a skill, staying focused, thinking flexibly or adjusting on the fly. Would these skills have helped? This is the handout that was referred to earlier that got emailed to you, where it does list um, sort of in, a, in layman's terms, um, less clinical kind of words, um, what skills we're actually talking about. We're talking about um, when kids have or lack these skills, the presence or the absence of these skills um, are going to be a predictor to adaptive or maladaptive behaviors. Having strong critical skills matters. Take a look at some of these skills. Anybody see that you have or know that you may need to build some of these skills? And I want to add for a second while we're waiting to see if we get any answers uh, that this is an interesting and important part of CPS because a lot of times when we start to explain skill, not will, um, what we hear from folks is that the kid knew how to do the thing we were asking them to do or they had the skill of the whatever the tangible skill is like 
uh, they didn't do their homework and they know how to do their homework or they didn't do their chore and they know how to do their chore. And so we always like to really quickly clarify that is a skill, but that's a different skill than what we're talking about in collaborative problem solving. When we say it's skill, not will, we're often talking about these thinking skills, what we call them thinking skills, um, cognitive skills that help us deal with situations that might be hard. So it's skills like the ones you see on the paper uh, on the slide in front of you uh, that get in the way of kids doing things that we've asked them to do or doing things that they, we know they're capable of doing. Uh, so it's more about these skills than the, the sort of more obvious visible skill in front of you. Sometimes that's the case that they just didn't know how to do the thing and we thought they did. Um, but more often it's a skill in this list that gets in the way of them managing things well. Yes, exactly. And so in the thinking back to the camera um, activity, right, what kind of skills did you need in that moment? What did you need to access in those moments that had you um, had them? Those things may have turned out in different in a different way. And we're thinking about the first situation with, with the challenging or challenges you had working with a child or a young person thinking about what skills were needed in that moment for them to manage it differently. I love the staying calm when frustrated. Because when do you need to be calm? Most of the time when you're frustrated, right? It's a skill that you, that you need to be able to access in the moment. We've got good at, good at thinking of more than one way to do something. I love that flex, cognitive flexibility is what we call that. Knowing when you hurt someone's feelings, so really being attuned with other people. Yeah, so having these strong, having these strong skills matter because what we say is people do well if they can, and if they're not doing well, then something's getting in the way. And wouldn't it be nice if we could help them figure out what it was? Conventional wisdom would say people do well sort of if they want to, which then puts us in a position of making people want to, right, um, as Carmen uh, just mentioned. But what we say is you can't teach, you can't, what, what, sorry, what conventional wisdom does is try to make the impossible possible. What we want to do is make, help, make the possible the impossible possible by building these skills right and um, we talk about lots of things I want to do I can't do I don't have the skills or sometimes in certain moments um, doesn't look so pretty I always use the example of um, when I'm driving I consider myself a good driver I have good points I'm, I'm doing well but if it's late at night and I'm driving down a dark road that I'm not familiar with and it's raining, I'm going to look drive a little bit differently. And the people around me might say, she's a bad driver or she's an old lady driver. They're only taking a picture of that moment. Um, what's getting in the way of for me is I'm nervous and I'm anxious in that moment. So when we think about why skills matter, here is more of a a grouping of the areas that we're talking about, right? Um, frustration tolerance, flexible thinking, problem solving. We think about two-year-olds are notoriously bad at a lot of skills, but luckily their brain grows, our brains grow through age 30. And we also know that trauma impacts development beyond normal um, development. Um, and so we can predict that there are going to be some challenges with folks who lack or these skills aren't, haven't been developed to the point that they need to be. Carmen, you want to share a little story? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a story and you might know this story. Uh, so, and I look, just to be totally clear, I'm an armchair sleuth, <laughs> uh, a true crime aficionado of sorts. And so you might be more familiar with this case than I am, but based on my limited research, uh, years ago at this point, there was a case uh, with a student at Virginia Tech, and maybe you remember this, um, 
David Eisenhower. He was a sophomore, I believe, and he was a smart kid. Uh, he was a double major. He had a very hard major. It was a science-y, math -y major. I don't remember the name of it, but it was not an easy course of study. He was an all-county athlete in Maryland. I think he came to Virginia Tech on a scholarship. Um, a really smart, bright kid. Clearly a kid with a lot of skills in some areas. And if you remember the case, what I believe happened, he, he met someone online. Um, and he didn't know that she was underage. She was 14, 13, very young. And when he learned that she was underage, he got nervous and he panicked. And uh, if you recall, what he ended up doing was arranging to meet this uh, young girl and he killed her. Uh, and he's in jail now. Uh, I think he got a 75 year sentence. And another student helped him uh, after he had uh, committed the murder. He had a student help him sort of uh, get rid of uh, her body and, and that sort of thing. And it was a really interesting case at the time. It's a good reason to think about CPS and skills. Um, Often when we're thinking about this model, we're thinking about kids who are in our programs, treatment foster care, residential care, and they have really obvious, clear challenges. Um, but this is a kid who was really bright and who was doing very well. Um, he didn't have any history of mental health. He didn't have any history of um, involvement with the system. His family was stable. He had a good home life. Clearly, he had some challenges. Um, but it wasn't anything that was recognized up to that point. And I don't believe that even in his defense, I don't think they found him to be um, you know, to have been struggling with mental health or um, anything that would have, ex you know, sort of gotten him off for the crime, so to speak. Um, but in the paper around that time, they wrote this quote, he was a boy who was academically gifted but oblivious to social cues. While very intelligent, he was bad at handling situations where there were not clear rules and where he did not have all the data. He could not deal well with anxiety and fear. And this is sort of the essence of the idea of skill, not will. Here is a very bright boy. He was doing a lot of things very well. And he found himself in a situation where his skills were not big enough or strong enough for the problem in front of him. And sort of the irony to me is that that problem is a really important one when you realize you're an 18 or 19 year old talking to an underage kid. Um, but what's the really clear, obvious solution? Stop talking to her. He hadn't met her uh, previous to that one engagement. So he could have just stopped talking to her and it would have been over. He could have asked for help. He could have told his parents. Um, he didn't do any of that. His first and only solution was to um, kill her, unfortunately, for for her and unfortunately for him. Um, she was a young girl. She lost her life. Um, and this was a kid who panicked and um, the only other explanation to me seems like he would have had to have been a, a psychopath or a sociopath, and that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, and it's a really dramatic, drastic and dramatic example of a kid faced with a problem who didn't have the skills to deal with that problem. Um, and so he had a, a number of lagging skills that they mentioned in this article, reading social cues, thinking about great solutions to problems, um, figuring out what to do when there was some ambiguity, lots of cognitive flexibility challenges. Um, and I use this story not to be dramatic, but to say for every kid, uh, not just kids who are in, in social service programs or who are clearly struggling in big obvious ways, but for every kid, it's sort of a, a segue into adulthood that you have to learn how to solve problems and you have to have the skills to deal with situations that are hard. Um, and so, like I said in my intro, I feel really passionately about helping everybody grow skills because we all need them. Um, and we can see even with kids like this one who on paper seem to have it all together, uh, there's a real value in looking at and helping them build certain critical thinking skills so that, you know, God forbid they find themselves in a situation like this, that they do it a little differently and, um, in a way that obviously is, is safer for people. So that's that's our story about you know the importance of skills for everyone really, not just the most obvious kids, but certainly those kids too, uh, because as we're gonna talk about later, they have their share of problems in front of them. And so we certainly wanna make sure they have the skills to meet those problems. Um, I just will say the document we sent you is actually a, a couple of things in one. It's what we call the APT, the assessment and planning tool. And I would caution you that without the full training, you might not want to try to use that yet. You're welcome to try. But the second page of it is a the thinking skills inventory. And so it's a, a checklist. And so you can sort of look through all the different skills and mark off ones that you think a particular kid is really good at or really struggles with. There's also a Likert version that we use as sort of a, uh, a measuring tool that we can do 
over time. So you have that in your email, um, and we may use that in an activity later. So if you can pull it up or keep it nearby, that will be helpful. So skills are the philosophy, right? And we talk about CPS, collaborative problem solving. I will tell you that CPS is the worst acronym there ever could be. We didn't pick it, obviously. Uh, but whenever we say P CPS, we're always going to mean collaborative problem solving, and we're never going to mean child protective services in the scope of this training anyway. Um, and so the philosophy that people do well when they can, not when they want to, is really the heart of CPS. And sometimes we liken it to wearing a fabric versus putting on a hat. People want to learn the tool of CPS, which is the Plan B conversation. We're going to talk briefly about that today. That's a hat. You can put it on. You can take it off. You might do a Plan B with some kids. You might not do one another day. Uh, but whether you're wearing the hat or not, we can always wear the fabric of CPS. And that's really that philosophy that people do well if they can, not if they want to. So we encourage our staff and our families to really try to wear that fabric every day, whether or not you put the hat on for a week straight, you know, so we certainly want to use the intervention. We want staff and families to do plan B's. Uh, that's our intervention. That's our hat. Uh, but maybe more importantly is to really believe that people are doing the best they can with the skills they have. And that's our fabric. That's everything we wear is going to be woven of that belief that everyone's doing the best they can and this with the skills they have in any given moment. And we want you to believe that about yourself. <laughs> uh, we want you to believe that about your kids, uh, your spouse, if that's possible, you know, that it's a really a very universal philosophy and it is transformative in what you do when you have a kid or someone having a problem. So we've talked a little bit about skills. This is obviously a, a crash course in CPS. Um, but skills are half of the equation. They're not the whole equation. Uh, we talk about having two levers to pull in a situation where you've got a kid struggling, um, They've, they're facing a problem, right? And so we, we would say you have two levers to pull. You can either adjust the problems they're facing, you know, get rid of some problems or lighten the load of those problems, or you can work on making sure that kid has the skills they need to deal with that problem. Um, and sometimes we can adjust problems. You know, we can drop expectations for kids. We can change uh, the way something is set up so that a kid doesn't encounter so many problems. So it is possible as adults to, you know, have a little bit of control over the problems the kid is facing. And, you know, at least in our work, some of our programs are in treatment foster care. That's a really big problem <laughs> that we can't always do anything about. We can't, we don't get to make the call about where a child's living all of the time. Uh, it's decided by someone other than us. And so we work with a lot of kids who have really big problems that they didn't cause, <laughs> that, that they found themselves in. And those problems demand a really high level of skill. And so in our, um, in using the CPS approach, we really focus on, gosh, what skills does this kid need to be able to deal with their life <laughs> successfully, or at least um, adaptively better. And so we really want to work on that lever because a lot of times that's the only one we have any control over is the, the amount of skill someone has. So our interventions then need to be focused on building skills. So we want to pick interventions that are skill focused. Um, we can still do work around the problems, but that that skill development becomes really important to us. And so if that's our focus, if that's what we believe that people do well when they have skills to do well, then then even down to our disciplinary um, reactions, we're going to pick interventions that are skill based. And that's what CPS does. OK, so whoops, too many. So you've probably seen a version of this. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. It's very wordy and sciencey, but I'm going to Get it, give you the layperson version. So in most traditional conventional wisdom kind of approaches to thinking about behavior, you see something like this image, and I'll walk you through it. Let me see if I can find a pointer. Here we go. So the idea is <laughs> a lot of times the most obvious thing about a child who's having a hard time is their behavior. There's some sort of uh, loud or easily visible or obnoxious behavior, right? But the full equation is that something happens and it prompts some sort of behavior from the child. And if that behavior is good, awesome. <laughs> if that behavior is compliant, great. And if it's not, there's some sort of consequence. Most of our conventional approaches to discipline uh, would tell you to consequence the behavior. And you can use a, a positive consequence, like a reward, if it's good behavior, or you can use a negative consequence, like a punishment, if it's bad behavior. And so you'll hear people talk about the ABCs, right? That's a pretty standard approach to looking at 
um, challenging behaviors or trying to help kids who are struggling. And it's often focused on this middle circle, the behavior. And the idea with consequences, whether it's good or uh, positive or negative, is that our consequence, we can pick it, we can tailor it to the child, and we can pick the world's most perfect consequence so that the next time this antecedent comes back around, they'll do a different behavior. They'll comply or they'll act better or act appropriately or whatever. And so there's a lot riding on picking this perfect consequence because it's supposed to drive this whole cycle the next time. So let me pause here for a second. You can use the chat window to tell me, have you ever used this cycle and found that the consequence didn't work or didn't reduce the behavior or didn't stop the problem from happening again? And so, and what I'll tell you just to, to ease any worries, you can still use consequences. We're, we're not gonna say that they're off the table forever, but we're just gonna look at them a little bit differently. Lots of people saying, yeah, this is often my experience, right? And so, um, you know, for better or worse, mostly for worse in my mind, this is like the main way that teachers are taught to respond to behavioral challenges. It's the main tool we get as parents um, from the time you come home with a baby. Um, and all of our discipline responses tend to fall in some fashion in the circle, you know, time out or taking things away or grounding. They're all based on this idea if the consequence is bad enough, it'll prevent the kid from doing it again. Um, and that is great if it works <laughs> and it's not so great if it doesn't work and like someone said uh, it, does, it doesn't always work and it often increases the behavior that we're trying to get rid of or increases another behavior because they don't like the consequence. Um, what are some other downsides of this? How does it impact your relationship with your kid? Has anyone, and keep using the chat if you like, has anyone had an experience where this sort of cycle ha yeah, has impacted your relationship? They hate me. We are now trying to earn your privileges each day. Nothing. Else. Yeah, uh, it, it's very adversarial. That's a great way to describe it. I started acting like the kid. Amen. So, you know, this is 50 or 60 years in the making of this sort of system of discipline. Um, and in the longer version of this training, what we say is it's not um, a problem with the approach in science, the sort of design with mouse, mice in cages is, is designed to do a very few specific things. But in behavior and in discipline, we've used this system for a lot of things. So we've used it for more than it's really intended to do. Um, I'm seeing I'm the bad guy all the time. Yeah, it increases fear and hiding. Absolutely. It's not great for relationships, in other words. So let me tell you where CPS is a little bit different. So CPS still sees this play out, but in, so the, the problem with this consequence side is that you have to wait for the antecedent to happen and you have to wait for the behavior to happen and then you get to pick a consequence. And so it means that this whole thing has to have already occurred before you intervene. And so that's our conventional approach down here. In CPS, we are more interested in this first half of the equation, the green circle. So the antecedent, just to put some examples to that could be an expectation you give like please go clean your room that's an antecedent that will trigger some behavior so they might go clean it or they might throw a tantrum or they might say they're going to clean it but they don't and <laughs> you find them playing two hours later right so the antecedent could be an expectation you give the antecedent can also look like um, a situation that's kind of predictably hard like every time you go to a birthday party your sensory kid can't handle it and they end up like running, screaming, you know, high on sugar, that sort of thing. The antecedent would be, you know, anytime we go to birthday parties. So there's this antecedent can take a few forms, but it's the situation that predictably leads to challenging behavior or the situation that predictably leads to noncompliance. And so in CPS, we take a long, hard look at this list. What are those situations? And I know at first this seems really challenging. It's a harder part of the model to figure out these, these situations. Um, that's a really important part. What are the things that ask more of this kid's skills than they can deliver? And this is really where CPS is different, is in between the antecedent and the child's response is the presence or absence of thinking skills. So if we say, hey, go clean your room, and they've got the skills to deal with that request, and they've got the skills to, to clean their room successfully, uh, then we're gonna see compliance, or at least um, adaptive behavior. Adaptive meaning not necessarily compliant, but more acceptable. So sometimes adaptive would be, I wanna clean my room, but my show is almost over, can I finish it first? So it's not compliant, but it's, um, a better response than tantruming or throwing things at you, for example. Um, 
So CPS says, well, what are these situations that are so hard and what are the skills that are required? And if we could build these skills and look at these situations, we could probably help this kid not have to have so many behaviors in the first place. If we figure out what's going here, going on here, we will see a reduction in behavior and the consequence is sort of a moot point. We don't really need them. And so you will hear, and it's true, that in CPS we're not really reliant on consequences. That's not to say you can't use them. We'll talk about when you would use them, but that they're just less relevant if we're focusing on this side of the circle. So that's the difference with CPS and most other major, you know, discipline models. Um, yeah, so our focus we don't ignore the behaviors, but they're not the focus of our intervention. The focus of our intervention is always going to be um, not so much on motivating kids to do better with the consequence, but on figuring out why they're not doing well in the first place and helping them, either by building those skills or understanding those antecedents and um, figuring out what's so hard about them. One other way of looking at this is this lovely graphic that we use quite a bit. So this is how CPS understands behavior is that there's what we would call a problem to be solved or a solvable problem. And if, and that's our antecedent, and if a kid has enough skill, we'll see great behavior or adaptive behavior. And if they lag behind in those skills or if they just don't have them in the moment, we're gonna see challenging behavior. And thus, in a CPS lens, behavior is pretty predictable. And probably many of you could tell me, anytime X happens, my kid, falls apart, right? So that's the predictability part that we know a lot of times what some of these triggers already are, what these antecedents are. And so we can we can go ahead and say, oh yeah, we know. Anytime we go to grandma's house, he has a really hard time and it usually results in a meltdown and us leaving early. That's a predictable problem. So we can use CPS to address that. Okay. I'm going to pause for a second and just say, Leslie, do you want to add anything at this point or chime in before I go any further? Nope, I'm good. Okay, great. And then I'm reading the comments. Yeah, you guys are someone saying teaching them how to navigate problems and letting my child have a voice. Yeah, I think it's a fascinating thing. And, and I was raised this way, too, so I'm not knocking it. Um, it's a fascinating thing that we you know, they're, we're raising adults, essentially, they're going to be adults, and you know that they need these skills as adults, and we don't really give them a ton of practice. Um, and so I think a lot about you know, that idea that kids are, should be seen and not heard. Well, when do they get to practice being heard? <laughs> because then they, they're going to be 18, and we want them to do it well, and they haven't had very much practice. So personally, since I'm a person who manages a lot of late teenage kids at my restaurant, young adults, um, I can see the difference in a kid who knows how to ne negotiate uh, their needs with our needs. Uh, who knows how to say, you know, I know you need me on Saturday, but it's my grandma's birthday. Can we figure that out versus the kid who just doesn't show up for a shift? So I think it's really important um, to build those skills, especially in older kids. Uh, someone says, what about teens? High schoolers are choosing to blow us off. That's a, that's a tricky question because it goes to the philosophy. Do we think it's manipulation or do we think it's skill? Um, I won't be able to convince anyone today, I'm sure, um, but I'm going to tell you that it's skill. <laughs> That's at least my belief. Uh, manipulation, I think there's a, a phrase we use a lot. We'd just be very hard pressed to find someone who doesn't want life to go well for themselves, uh, that wants to make life harder or that wants to have to deal with uh, poor relationships. Um, I think that when we think about kids who are really compliant, we often chalk it up to character. These are good kids. Um, and in fact, Things like taking other people's perspective into account and empathy and thinking about the impact of my actions on others, those are all skills on our list. And so a compliant kid, in my mind, is a kid who has a lot of skills. They can put their own needs on hold. They can switch gears very quickly when a parent asks them to do something when it isn't what they planned on doing. They have the skills to realize it's not the end of the world. Take a deep breath. Mom really needs me to do this. I can do it. Um, and so I think of compliant kids as kids who are really good at a lot of those skills. Um, and then I think about kids who are really maybe choosing to blow us off, they, that those are kids who, if we looked at that lagging skills list, we would see a number of skills um, in which they are a little deficit. You know, they have a hard time controlling impulse. They have a hard time uh, taking perspective for somebody else. They have a hard time expressing their concerns in words, and so they express their concerns in really obnoxious behavior <laughs> sometimes. So for me and for folks at UCPS, I think we can see even our most, you know, teens and kids who seem really manipulative, we can see that as a skill deficit. 
I mean, I would say that anytime you've got a kid whose best solution is to do something really kind of crappy, that's a bad problem solver. And so we can help them uh, use a different approach to meet their needs that doesn't really you know, impact other people so negatively. Yeah, so Rita's saying, well, you know, can they just be kids? Uh, yeah, I'm not necessarily suggesting they have to act like adults, but that as a kid, they can practice good problem solving with caregivers, right? That, that adults can teach them that you can come to a person and work out a problem um, without uh, putting too much on them too soon. It's, it's good natural skill development so that when they're 20, it's not the first time they're practicing, you know, good problem solving in a collaborative fashion. These are great comments. Thank you. How are we doing on time? Good. So we're going to switch gears, and I'm going to talk about one of the biggest parts of our training. Uh, we'll give you a, a taste of it and give you a little bit of chance to practice. Uh, in collaborative problem solving, so much of our focus is on that antecedent. And finding the antecedent, that situation that's sort of predictably challenging, can be kind of tricky. Um, and so to do it, uh, we want to kind of basically rewind the tape and we want to rewind backwards from the behavior and we want to think about um, what came before the behavior. So we can do that a number of different ways. We can just simply rewind the story in our head and say what was going on before that tantrum? Was there an expectation on the table? Was there a change in routine? What was happening that led to um, this kid having a tantrum? Um, we can also answer some of the questions on the slide. Like we can look at our routines and our schedules. We can look for patterns. Uh, you can ask yourself questions like, when does this kid most predictably have a hard time? What part of our day or routine is consistently difficult? Raise your hand if it's bedtime. <laughs> I'm running a parent group right now and uh, that parent group is almost always talking about bedtime. They have some younger kids. Waking up, uh, that's, that's my problem. <laughs> I have a hard time waking up. Um, yeah, so you could t probably tell me, and I'm going to ask you to in a minute, um, if you think about the kid you had in your head from earlier when Leslie was telling you to think of a child, you know, you could tell me their challenging behaviors, I'm sure. Um, and I would be, I would push you a step further to say, rewind backwards from that behavior, rewind backwards from the hitting, the screaming, the tantruming, the kicking, the running away, and tell me what preceded it. Um, it's the who, what, where, and whens of our kids' story. So sometimes it's you can find them by filling out the sentence, every time my kid has to blank, they have a hard time. And hard time is code for had some sort of frustrating behavior that we didn't love. So anytime there's a substitute, uh, anytime he has math homework, uh, anytime we have to do something on Saturday that he doesn't want to do, he just wants to lay around and, and we have things to do. Uh, we have a hard time. <laughs> and and we will encourage you to be really specific. So if you say he has a hard time with school, I might say, well, is it every class? Is it class time or is it in the hallways? Is it homework? Is it classwork? Um, and you can get really specific with your solvable problems so that we can solve each of them separately. The lagging skills, just to sort of fit this together, are the why. So he has a hard time when we go to birthday parties because he has a hard time with um, taking in lots of stimulus at once. So that lagging skill is the sort of explains why that situation might be hard. All right, I see some of you practicing in the side. That's great. I'm going to do an activity in a minute. So here's how it looks when you put kind of the three different components of CPS together. We've got a problem to solve, their antecedent, it goes here at the top. We've got a lagging skill, and really this is just a guess. We're guessing as to what the skill deficit is that's getting in the way in that moment. And we've got our challenging behavior. So we don't focus on it, but we still know it's there. So it would sound something like, my kid has difficulty when, and then we fill in our specific predictable problem. They're told they can't have more M&Ms because they have difficulty with, and then we look at our lagging skills list and we throw in a skill, they have a hard time managing disappointment. That's a big emotion. They have a hard time handling it. So anytime they have to handle disappointment, they don't do it well because we already said they're not good at it. And that's going to usually lead to some sort of behavior, which in this case is arguing and screaming. So it's a really specific solvable problem about they have a hard time when I tell them they can't have more candy. So let's look at another example, and I'm going to have you guys practice this in a minute. And Mary Beth, this will be our breakout group in two more slides if that helps. So here's another example. Often, let me just give you some 
some preface here. Usually when I meet with parents and I say, tell me about your kid, what's going on? Uh, they usually start with this dark orange box. They say, let me tell you all the stuff my kid's doing. And they're frustrated and burned out and usually very tired uh, and understandably so. And we, we lead with behavior. So I'll get a big dose of what all these behaviors are. And that's fine. That helps sort of understand how serious things are or how they're tired a parent might be. Um, and usually from there, I'm going to walk them backwards to this top box. So I'll say, okay, tell me about the swearing. When do you see or hear the most swearing? When is that happening? Well, whenever I tell her to put down the iPad and come to dinner, she loses it. Okay, so now I have some behavior and a solvable problem. A problem to solve. We use those terms kind of interchangeably. And so in the middle is our guess. Well, why do you think that's so hard for her? What's the skill? And, and people will say, oh, it's not hard for her. She just doesn't want to, right? They'll switch back to that conventional philosophy. And then I pull out the lagging skills list and I say, tell me which ones of these your kid struggles with. And at least in the work we do, we often have kids who have a, a difficulty with nearly every skill. It's, it's a really sad thing to see parents will assess their kid and say, oh, gosh, my kid struggles with almost all of these. Okay. Do you think these are important skills? Absolutely. Can you see how not having these skills could make situations hard? Yes. Can you find one that has something to do with putting down the iPad and coming to dinner? And in this case, the one we picked, they have a hard time handling transitions and keeping track of time. So when I tell them to put down the iPad and come to dinner, I know that I give her a 20 minute warning and a 10 minute warning and a five minute warning. But in her mind, it feels like I just told her and she's really mad and she swears. She's not ready to get off. So this isn't excusing bad behavior, just to be clear. Um, it, behavior that doesn't meet our standards is not good. <laughs> and we agree that kids that are hitting or fighting or hurting people or hurting themselves, those are not, um, those are serious behaviors. And, and we, like you, want to get rid of them. Uh, the only difference is it's not, it's not a difference in whether we think those are important or not. It's a difference in how we think we can affect them. So with CPS, we're not dismissing your behavior because it's not important. We are focusing on the antecedent because we think that's where our money is. That's where we think we can have the most change. Um, so that's why we focus a lot of our attention on figuring out these situations that are predictably challenging. Um, if you have a behavior and you can't figure out the predictable, predictable, eh, predictability piece, we might just ask you to think about the last time it happened. So when was the last time that the kid was swearing? Uh, last night when I told him to take a shower. Okay, that works. We'll put that here. Uh, he had a hard time when I asked him to take a shower. Might be talking about my house. <laughs> There's no swearing yet, but they do have a hard time with that. So that that's sort of a three-step way to make sure we've got the right information um, to start our problem solving. So do we know what the behavior is? Do we know what the solvable problem is? And do we have a guess as to what the lagging skill is? You don't have to be right about the lagging skill. It's just to keep us in sort of a skill not will mindset. Welcome back. Looks like you guys are, are they all back Mary Beth? Um, I wanna finish up this section. I'm gonna pass it off to Leslie. I wanted to do this activity, however brief it may have been, because these are sort of the three components of CPS. And what we end up with is a list of solvable problems, a list of, of situations. We have those antecedents separated from their behavior. And that's when we get to decide, what do we wanna do about that? You know, what, How do we wanna to respond to these problems that we see with their kid? Um, and so in our longer trainings, we talk about lots of time spent practicing finding the problem. And then we talk about your three options, which is CPS calls the three plans. So Leslie is going to talk to you about the three plans. Before we go to the plans, we're going to talk about what is what is our goal of our intervention? Like, how do we decide what to do? It, it really depends on your desired outcome, right? So here you'll see some of the listings of what our goals might be. We, we want to calm things down, right? We don't want our kids to continue to escalate or for us, right, to the situation to get worse. So we want to reduce that challenging behavior. We want to solve the problem durably. Like we want our kids to build the skills that they need in order to address those similar types of challenges that they may face, those similar um, Ex expectations or triggers perhaps that have set them on the path of challenging behavior. We also want to get our adult expectations met. We, we do want compliance, you know, whether it is for general safety um, or if it is so that the kid has, you know, is better at doing some things or is being helpful. And as you guys mentioned in your um, 
in the chat box um, that that sometimes you feel like you are the the dictator and it's not helpful in a relationship always to be um, giving consequences to kids so we want to create or restore a helpful relationship and then finally build the skills and confidence as, as Carmen has mentioned we don't want them to grow up too fast but we do want kids to be able to do this on their own we don't want them always externally motivated and then that way we have to always parent them, right? They're, they're going to be, hopefully, grow up to be independent, um, young, pe independent people. So when we are um, looking at it in CPS world, um, the way that we're going to approach is one of three of our three plans, right? We call them A, B, and C. It is not antecedent behavior consequence. It's just similar letters, right? And the thing is, you don't need a plan until you have a problem. Um, you don't have to default to any one of these plans. You should pick. It should be um, depending on the goal you're trying to achieve. So we're going to take a quick look at plan A. Uh, plan A, the goal is really compliance. It's, it's around, um, typically around safety. Um, situations. Um, it's designed to incentivize, encourage, and motivate somebody to do better. I mean, that's that's what all of the plans really are. Um, the assumption here is if they, they can do better if they just try harder. Um, it uses positive and negative reinforcement in order to increase external motivation. Um, who does well in these systems or um, you know, when is it easy for kids to comply or when do kids comply? Well, according to collaborative problem solving, it would be kids do well when they can, so they comply when they have the skills to meet the demand or the expectation that was placed on them. Um, plan A is really sort of that operant conditioning, as we as you mentioned before, um, and which was really intended to teach basic lessons for the first time right um, teach basic right from wrong and really it just increases intrinsic motivation I use the example of um, teaching a little boy to go pee pee in the potty and putting a Cheerio in the toilet I don't know if any of you guys have heard of that or done that you know and giving them a lollipop when they do well I really hope that you know at three four and five um, they're starting to move away from going pee pee to get a lollipop right um, and that when they are 13 14 and 15 they're not expecting you know their parents to still put the Cheerio in the potty and they get a lollipop when they do and especially expecting perhaps their wives or significant others as they grow up you know to have to do that um, what plan A doesn't do is it doesn't build complex thinking skills because the adult is really doing the thinking and doing the consequencing for the young person you guys already mentioned it doesn't create um, or or maintain a helping or helpful relationship kids aren't going to come to you so that you can give them consequences or rewards um, it doesn't tend to calm the situation down as someone even mentioned again earlier sometimes it can escalate the situation and cause more challenges for the young person and or challenges for you the adult um, and the the um, not um, building intrinsic motivation right it, it's not about we want to build character not just compliance with young people right so there are times as we said and settings in which this may be more appropriate or maybe even required like we have laws um, in our in our world and in our system um, we have rules um, at school right and and usually it's around you know large group um, management uh, and so it might be appropriate that we have some things. Um, it might be appropriate, um, it might be required around safety, as I said, safety concerns. Then there is Plan C. Um, a Plan C, uh, we call it the let it go plan. Um, it doesn't mean we're not um, a, um, 
addressing it, but we're letting go of the expectation for the time being. It is a conscious choice. It's not that we started an A and then we just give up because we're exhausted, because um, it didn't go the way we had expected. It really is intentional. We have an expectation, but if a kid doesn't meet it, we don't do anything about it. We, we, um, we let it go for now. We might have other situations or other issues that we want to make sure that we address. It's your decision, right? Um, it can calm things down, right? Because the expectation is there, but you're not trying to address it with them um, in the moment. Um, the situate plan B plan sorry plan seeing the situation that led to the behavior is not the same thing as ignoring the behavior that came from the situation. You know that a kid is going to have a hard time in a particular situation. The expectation is still that they sit still in class, but if they have to stand up, um, they're still got eye contact with the teacher, and it still appears that they're learning. The teacher isn't going to get into get into it with them or a power struggle or plan A, you have to sit in your seat in order to participate in this activity. Um, it calms things down, it reduces the temperature of the situation, and you can always come back to and address what you have chosen to plan C. And then we have plan B. Um, this is really what um, the hat, as Carmen mentioned, of collaborative problem solving is around. We want a win-win solution. We want to address our adult concern and we want to hear what the young person's concern is, what their struggle is in managing the situation differently, right? Um, it's going to require some things. It's got what we call three ingredients, the first of which is empathy. Right, so on your app, I, I think on one side it should actually, I don't know if it has the rehearsing of the conversation, but in there you're going to want to hear what the young person's concern or perspective is on the, uh, on the expectation or the situation. Hey, seems like you had a hard time sitting still in your desk today. What's up with that? You want to hear from the young person why they struggled or what the struggle was. Um, and they may not even be concerned um, with it, but they do have a perspective. And that's where you're going to spend most of the time in a plan B, um, understanding where their struggle is. You also want to share your adult concern, but this is going to be a really brief statement, and it's going to be around their health, their safety, their impact on learning, or their impact on others. We don't want to go into the Charlie Brown speeching, um, is what I call it, when kids just hear, mah, 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 right? We really want to just make our concern very brief um, because when we make our statement and we share our concern, it could, could cause a young person to get a little bit dysregulated. They're so used to probably you asking them how they feel or think about something, and then we say, but I really need you to do this thing, um, rather than an and, um, and really having them do the final step, which is inviting them to brainstorm, coming up with solutions, again, that are both going to address the young person's concern and your adult concern. And really, in a plan B, anyone can do them. Um, you can do them adult to adult, partner to partner. It is actually a philosophy, as uh, Carmen said, that we use within UMFS. Um, there are We have challenging behaviors, even as staff. Um, and so we want to make sure, and we feel like this is a really respectful way, and it is an inclusive way to understand what somebody's struggles could be. And it puts us in a position of helping um, and not controlling. We've done a lot of Plan Bs over the years. We've Plan B hygiene a lot, um, Instagram or laptop or computer use. As a society, some of us have had to Plan B COVID-19 restrictions, right? Um, and thinking about how you are managing it um, is really also um, is important. Sorry, I'm looking at the at the questions. 
question about empathy. What if every time you ask, you're met with, I don't want to talk? Well, it sounds like that might be um, uh, s something to talk about or listen to or even to plan B. Is it the time of day that you're, you're trying to talk to them, right? So after school, I don't know that teenagers um, want to talk. So after, you know, again, after school. So you might want to, like Carmen talked about, um, when you're looking at the problem to be solved, talk every time? Or is it, are you going at bedtime or in the middle of the evening when they'd rather watch TV? So you might want to break that out of when you're trying to have the conversation. It doesn't have to be in the heat of the moment. There are emergency plan Bs that you might do in the heat of the moment. There are spontaneous plan Bs when the kid seems to be ready to have a conversation. Um, and so it's also having um, preparing the young person that you want to talk to them about it. Um, and it could be that they don't want to talk because they don't believe you're actually going to listen. So I, I would try to break that down a little bit. What if the kid... See, sorry. Go ahead. I also see in a lot of your just questions in the chat window, but what you're basically saying is, what if my kids' lagging skills get in the way of us doing this? Like, if they don't communicate or they don't share or they just shrug and grunt or they don't, they say, I don't know everything. To me, all of those are lagging skills, so sort of signs of lagging skills. Um, and don't be daunted by those because that's why we're doing the plan B is because they're not very good <laughs> at expressing themselves in words. So part of the reason we do plan B is and part of what you see after practicing with kids is that they get better at, at explaining, right? They get better at expressing concerns. And some of that is about just practicing talking uh, and putting words to emotions. But some of that is trusting a process where they see that their perspective is taken into account. So there's uh, more investment in sharing what their concern is because they know that it matters in a plan B. Um, so that's, that's a little bit, it could be for a couple of different reasons that they're doing that. One is trust and one is lagging skills. And in my mind, either of those is a reason to keep doing it. Absolutely. And the other thing, because I did see this something about accountability and it's hard not to, it's hard to have empathy um, when it's not, I don't know, it was my fault kind of thing. Um, and that's why, I mean, going through some training and also really being in that empathy ear, like, and you just want to hear what they have to say. If they feel like the teacher is terrible, mean, or stupid, it might be around understanding what they mean by that. Like what, why would why do they believe that the teacher is terrible has the teacher done or said something is it you know so again that's where that you can sort of sit in that empathy piece of really just hearing what they have to say because you're not trying to correct their thought you're not trying to correct or change their perspective you're really trying to get it um, this one person said, I asked, try asking questions with a thumbs up or thumbs down. So if a young person has difficulty communicating, A, if that's one of their lagging skills, or in the moment they're, they're struggling with it, then yeah, getting a thumbs up or a thumbs down, anything to let you know that you're on the right, right track. Um, clap if you can hear me right now. Um, that might be more of a plan A um, because you're trying to get your point across. Um, you're really in empathy trying to hear what they're having to say. Um, interested to see how ADHD and or autism spectrum play into these strategies. Well, um, as in uh, as Carmen had mentioned, like do you you're I want to ask, like, is it you're thinking that if your child has ADHD, they are going to struggle more? They may have more lagging skills and how that might play into it. I can't remember who that was. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, and we, somebody on the spectrum or is it is it related to lagging skills? So we don't want to I call it name calling, you know, and, and tagging um, ADHD, autism spec like kids aren't necessarily going to get better at those diagnoses but they can definitely build skills within the within their their realm um, that help them address and meet other expectations or other demands that may be placed on them because just because for example two kids are diagnosed with ADHD they may have different set of skills which cause different situations um, they to be, they respond adaptively or with challenging behaviors. 
we've we've done tons of plan b's with kids on the spectrum um and again everybody's got lagging skills and the ones that are affiliated with um, autism spectrum tend to be pretty predictable um uh, some for example cognitive flexibility we've got some really rigid thinking right and they like predictability and they like things to be a certain way um, and plan b goes great with those kids because they're often very articulate about what their concerns are and what their needs are um, and it helps them practice flexibility and of course uh, other kids on the spectrum are nonverbal completely and then that's a different type of work in plan b obviously um, and we, we're able to plan b with kids that are nonverbal in the same way that you know, you still have to find a way to communicate with that kid and learn what their needs are. And, and usually people working with kids who are nonverbal or parenting kids who are nonverbal have already learned how those kids express their needs. And so we'll use the same type of communication. We can draw it. We can use devices. We can write it out. Um, they can <laughs> use nonverbal signs to let you know what their concerns are. Um, so there's different ways we can adapt our plan B. Um, but for kids on the spectrum who are you know, this isn't a diagnosis, but what would have been that old Asperger's definition? Those kids tend to do great in Plan B's, and they're a lot of fun. <laughs> they're very communicative, so it can be a, a really rewarding conversation. So that's my experience, at least. And then as the statement says on the bottom, we can teach you how. Remember, this is just really a brief overview, a brief introduction of understanding of collaborative problem solving. And um, there's more intensive training and more practice. Um, and as Carmen has mentioned, like ways, um, we even talk about the emergency plan B, spontaneous plan Bs, working with kids who have difficult communication is their lagging skill. Um, so we're, we, there is more potentially more to come. Um, and we'll talk about that at the very end. Carmen is going to share an example of how a uh, plan B. Mm -hmm. Oops. Oh, sorry. I clicked it Go ahead. Yeah. All right. So this is just to put some, um, some a real life example to the plan B process. I'm going to go through it quickly and I think we'll be able to wrap up with some questions. Um, so this was a plan B and the reason this one's significant in my mind is that uh, what was happening, this was in our school, uh, one of our schools, is that uh, staff were about to put this on a kid's IEP. The kid smelled really bad and there was a suspected hygiene issue. And so the, someone had mentioned, um, can we put this as a goal on their IEP or one of their um, goals for the year? And so we're talking about a goal that they were gonna have to measure and track and report back on for like, nine to 12 months. And so that's a big undertaking. And one of the staff said, hey, can I try to just plan B this real fast before we put this on this kid's, you know, year long um, path of work to work on. So he went to the kid and said, hey, you know, we noticed uh, you're having a hard time. Uh, where, there's some odor problem we're having. What's up with that? You know, a, a nice neutral opening, not overly focused on behavior. And so what he found out was that it was the kid's coat that smells really bad. Um, and so in empathy, we're not trying to correct, we're not trying to get the kid to just agree that they should do, we're just really interested in their perspective. So what this teacher uh, administrator found is that the kid lives on a farm, this is a really rural area, and this was their coat that they worked on, worked in the farm on. And so they would get up in the morning and milk cows and do all this stuff, and then he would wear the coat to, to school. And the coat just reeked, it just stunk. <laughs> it was a Carhartt coat, it was this kid's favorite coat, he really liked it, it's a great coat, and it smelled terrible, like many animals. <laughs> and so um, in empathy, what the teacher learns is, oh, okay, so your concern is, you, you know, this coat is really important to you. And what he specifically learned is that he wasn't sure if the coat was washable. And so the kid didn't know if it was washable, and so he just hadn't washed it. What lagging skill is that? Not great problem solving. <laughs> not really looking for solutions. Also not asking for help with a problem. So there's some communication skill deficits there. So the kid says, yeah, I love this code. It's really important to me and I don't wanna wash it if it can't be washed. And the teacher went to the second ingredient. I hear you, that sounds really valid. And uh, my concern is that the odor of the coat is really impacting your teachers and your friends. Um, and that's it, the second ingredient, really short and sweet. They don't have to agree with us. They don't even have to care about it. They just have to hear another perspective. So the kid says, yeah, sorry, can't help you. And the teacher said, well, maybe, what can we do? Is there something we can do? Um, so that we don't mess up your car heart because the coat's really important to you and the smell doesn't impact other people. Do you have any ideas? And then we wait and we want to see, does this kid have problem solving skills? Given two sets of concerns, can he find a solution? And so he said, well, I don't know if it can be washed. Can we figure out if it can be washed? And the teacher said, sure. How could we, um, 
you know, how could we find that out? Well, could you Google it? Yeah, let's Google it right now. Uh, the teacher, funny aside, he said after he Googled it, he got so many ads for Carhartt coats in all of his like online ads, really funny. Anyway, uh, so yeah, they found out quickly it was washable. So then they talked through the solution. So we can wash it. Does that work for your concern? Yeah, if it's washable and it won't hurt the coat, then yeah, we can wash it and that works for me. Do you think that works for my concern about the odor? Yeah, because if we wash it, it won't stink. Okay, is that doable? Is it for a different kid, we might say feasible depending on the age or developmental level. Can we do that? Um, well, I don't know if my home washer can wash it. Well, we have a washing machine here at school. Can we wash it here? Uh, yeah, that's fine if you don't mind. Uh, if we do it, will it cause other problems? And just to be really clear, we're asking the kid these questions. Our brains know how to do this, so we want the kid to practice. These are the questions you ask yourself when you're trying to decide if something is a good solution. Does it meet my own concerns? Does it meet other people's concerns? Is it realistic and doable? Will it cause other problems? And when we got to that fourth question, the kid said, yes, I don't want it to smell like a girl. I don't know what that means, <laughs> but in this kid's mind, it meant he didn't want it to smell flowery. And so the teacher said, oh, so you, you're you okay washing it, but you don't want it to smell girly, whatever that is. Sure. Um, well, why don't we look at the laundry detergents and see if any of them work for you? So they went to the laundry room. He smelled the detergents. He was okay with one of them. And they washed the coat right that moment um, and sort of talked about what they would do in the future. Could he try to wash it at home? Could he let him know when it smelled again, et cetera? Um, and then the last question is always, well, let's check back in a week or in a few days, depending on the solution. Sometimes you need to check back sooner. Sometimes you need to give it time to see how it's working. Uh, and so they agreed that they would check back in a week and see how the coat smelled and make sure the kid was happy with the scent and all of that. Um, but it was done and solved that afternoon. And so we think about, um, you know, this could have been something that teachers and students were trying to work on for a year and having to report on. And in a quick plan B, they sort of figured out the kids' needs and found a solution that worked. And the kid did the bulk of the work. So for the person who asked about accountability, and that's sort of how we think about plan B helping accountability is that this kid's involved in the solution. And, and often we want the kid to think of the solution. So there's sort of built in accountability. So that's an example of a really easy plan B, really easy, but also a really important one because it was really impacting a lot of people um, and quite stinky. So, um, yeah, that's that's our pea coat example for you of plan B. And we have lots more stories uh, in our in our library. So a quick summary of our plans. You can pick any plan you want. We want people to be mindful of picking a plan, not because. They don't, we don't want you to pick the plan based on how mad you are or how annoying the behavior is, but based on what your goal is. So if you really need compliance right this moment, plan A is your best bet, but plan A doesn't always work. So you could try plan A and see if you get compliance. But if you really just need to calm things down in your home, you should try plan c as much as you can because plan C is the calm down plan. If you're trying to do anything else, plan B is the only plan that's designed to do these other things. So we really, you know, I think in our history staff have said, um, well, it sounds like I can't use plan A. I'm not allowed to. You're allowed to. You have three plans. We just want people to really think about what each plan can achieve and pick the plan that really is going to do what you want it to do. All the plans are there at your disposal. If you're only plan a though, you might expect that you're not going to get very far with some of these other goals. I'm going to go quickly through these and then we'll answer some more questions. This is less relevant maybe for some of you, but as an agency, some of the reasons we picked CPS, it is based in what we know on how the brain works. We know it, it's trauma informed. It follows, if you've read anything by uh, Dan Siegel, the idea that we have to regulate kids' brains first, calm them down, then we can relate and reason last. And so this follows the flow of a plan B that our problem solving, our reasoning happens last in the process after we've sort of connected and and done some relating work. It builds re resiliency, which we know if we're working with kids with trauma, resiliency is the, the response. Resiliency trumps trauma, trumps ACEs. Uh, and it honors youth voice and choice, which is really important, and family engagement. Um, kids have lots of input. Their voice is equal. Uh, concerns are an equal playing field. And really importantly, that we're really interested in character over compliance. We don't want to build robotic kids who do what whoever is the more powerful person says to do. We want them to do the right thing because it's the right thing. Um, the, this is a headline I saw a couple years ago. Um, and, you know, it just sort of speaks to that might makes right mentality. We're not trying to build that. We're trying to get people to do the right thing because it's the right thing. Later in the article that this headline went with, it said that the 
the Ford versus Chevy argument was what caused the Bedford shooting and that uh, the man shot this person five times. And so we look all around and see examples of bad problem solving and an inability to sort of prioritize um, you know, mutually satisfactory solutions. And we think that CPS can do that. We know that it can do that. So we, we see an urgency and a need for it. And we really want to sort of build kill kids with good character. Uh, it's really important to us. Um, really quickly, UMFS offers parent groups. Uh, they are virtual right now. We run them multiple times a year. Um, you can join our Facebook group. It's called B, the letter B, the change. It's affiliated with UMFS on Facebook. And we post the dates and the registration links there. I can also send them to um, Mary Beth, but that's one way to keep learning. The book pictured called Changeable is written by Dr. Ablon, who runs Think Kids. That's a great basic overview of the model, easy read. Um, and we also train other groups and um, and so if you're interested in training, we would encourage you to reach out and we can talk about what's what's available. Um, I'm seeing we've got a few minutes and we can answer some questions if that's OK. I think that's our last slide. Yep. Um, what does regulate mean? So regulate references calming being in a state of enough calm that you can operate from the top part of your brain, which is your, you know, the part of your brain that has reasoning and logic and um, the ability to hear other perspectives and think flexibly. So if you're dysregulated, your brain is operating from sort of a, a more of an emergency state, fight, flight, or freeze, and you won't have access to the really good problem solving parts of your brain. So Dan Siegel says you've got to regulate first. You have to get kids to a place where they can think clearly so that they can access that prefrontal cortex and do the good problem solving. And a lot of times we slip into disciplinary styles that require this top part of our brain but our kid is really in their downstairs lower brain, and so it doesn't work very well. Uh, please run through a plan B where the child is resistant. Yeah, we've done lots of plan Bs. In the empathy ingredient, the reason we start with empathy is because it's regulating. They get to go first. They get to tell us their concerns. And one of the things we do in empathy is lots of reassurance. So it's not a plan A, right? It's a plan B. So because we're not plan a we can say things like, you're not in trouble. I am not uh, going to punish you. I'm really interested in what your perspective is. I'm sure this is a great one. I'm sure you have a really good reason, um, but I just don't know what it is. <laughs> Can you help me understand? And um, we've had kids that we've been playing being with after some pretty aggressive behavior in our uh, residential program in Richmond. We've had kids uh, doing, you know, self-harming or um, being aggressive to other kids and having to plan B with them and offering loads of reassurance. Hey, it's going to be okay. I'm here to help you. We're going to figure this out together. Um, uh, we have other times where they're just resistant as in they don't want to share. And again, lots of times we can reassure them. Hey, I know that you're used to getting in trouble and you're used to adults just telling you what to do. This is something different. I'm really interested in your perspective. I actually don't think we can solve it without your perspective. Can you help me? Um, okay. What other questions? I see requests for the, the slides. Yeah, hi other? everyone. Yeah, um, I will send the slides along with the document from today, uh, with the flyer um, from Marie, and a link to the uh, YouTube recording um, to everyone next week. So please be on the lookout for that. And if you'd like, I'll, we just sent out our newest flyer with parent group dates. I can send that, Mary Beth, if you just want to include that as well. That would be great. Thank you. The program at Mass General is called Think Kids. Um, that's their logo in the corner. Uh, their website is thinkkids.org, and they're a great resource as well. Um, and because so many trainings are being done online, you can find some of their work, too, if you want to attend training through them. <laughs> so how does one get into this work you do? Um, that's a, I don't know. That's a great question. Um, if you're talking about CPS specifically, Helen, I think kids has certification tracks. So you can attend what's called a tier one training, a tier two training, and then you can apply to be a certified practitioner or a certified trainer. So there's a lot of ways to grow and, um, you know, then you can be helpful to your community or your school or whatever. It is fascinating. It's my favorite part of our job. And there was one, what if the response when asking for perspective is, I don't care? We get that a lot. Um, 
don't be daunted by that. To me, that either means I don't think you're going to listen. I don't think it's going to matter. I don't know what my concern is and it's, I can't think fast enough. So there's lots of different lagging skills in there. If, if they don't know their concern, it may be that they've got some processing delays or it just takes them longer. So we're often willing to sit with it and say, it's okay. Just think about it for a second. What, what's really hard about birthday parties? What's really hard about trash? What do you hate about it? I'm sure there's a really good reason. Um, yeah, go ahead, Leslie. I was just going to say, the other thing is you might get a response of, I don't care when you share your adult perspective. Um, that's more often where, where kids might say, I don't care. A and that's okay. They don't, here's the beauty of this. They don't have to care right now up front. What they do have to do is take your expectation, your concern into consideration when coming up with the solution. So, um, and just thinking about the way that we operate when we're stressed, we like, we are very protective of ourselves and our own um, world. And so we don't want to take somebody, you know, have to consider. But so when we're coming up with the, so there, when the kid is coming up with a solution, the other thing that collaborative problem solving and especially a plan B does or requires of the adult is to have this skill of cognitive flexibility to really, as somebody said, multiple there are multiple solutions to problems um, and oftentimes or to get your expectation met so often you have to as the adult be willing to almost take the risk and 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 uh, be flexible enough for a child to do to meet a demand differently than the way you did as a child or the way that you initially expected them to get it done These are great questions. We could talk about CPS all day long. Uh, Leslie, will you throw your email in the chat window? Feel free to reach out if you need more information, but hopefully some of the emailing that Mary Beth will send you has some additional information that you'll find helpful too. But we'll put our emails just in case. Oh, thanks everybody. Uh, really wanna appreciate, I really do appreciate the, the presentation today. I learned so much. Um, thank you, Leslie and, um, and Carmen, this was great. I don't know, we might have to have you guys back for part two. Um, I think we would have a lot of interest um, in, in our families taking, um, taking even a more in-depth look at this. So, um, yeah, so I think, yes, we're getting a lot of support for part two. So um, I think it, a follow-up would be really awesome. So, um, but thank you everyone. We really appreciate you being here today. Um, I will get all the information out to you all um, at the beginning of next week. And um, we really appreciate your time. And we hope that everyone has a fabulous uh, Friday and a great weekend. And take care. And certainly, please reach out to the Parent Resource Center um, if you have um, any other questions, you need some additional resources. Um, I copy down the names of uh, Dr. Um, Ablin's books um, that I think we're going to need to get for our library. Um, so uh, please do visit our library online at our website. And, um, you know, we want to be able to support you in any way that you can. So please. Um, uh, give us a call or shoot us an email and uh, we'll be able to help. So thanks everyone.